This is The Conversation on Hawaii Public Radio. I'm Catherine Cruz. Joining us today is Andrew Robbins, Executive Director of the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation. He took over a year and a half ago. Welcome. Thank you very much. A year and a half. You okay? I'm doing great. <laughs> what is that in dog years? <laughs> oh, about 10 years, I guess. Now, when I first met you, you had white hair. <laughs> you were representing Bombardier the first go around when we were trying to determine which technology to go with. Right. So you're uh, pretty familiar with, with our setup here, and I think that was part of the reason why you were chosen um, to take over as Hart Executive Director. Yes. I, I made my first trip to Hawaii, I think, in 1990. So I've been around this project uh, in and out for many years now. And so uh, tell us, what, what's happening now? You, we've got this uh, recovery plan that the FTA officials are reviewing. There was a, a hiccup because of the shutdown. Explain where we're at. Right. So we, we originally submitted our recovery plan back in uh, September of 2017, right after I started in this position. And we did a major update in November of 2018. And the major revision had to do with uh, identifying what our project delivery method would be for City Center and Pearl Highlands, being the public-private partnership approach. So that went in in November, this past November. And FTA was planning to review that in depth in January. But unfortunately, with the shutdown, that did not occur. So this month is when they're now picking up the review of the plan. Okay, but they may have already started that, I would think, because it's March. The shutdown didn't last that long. Right. Well, they, they were backed up, uh, having been out of the office for about 30, I think it was 35 days. But, yes, I expect that they are already in their review meetings. Uh, you know, this is already March 12th, I guess, so they should be well underway with their review. Okay, and then you plan to meet face fi- face-to-face with them, hopefully in April? Yes, I expect, uh, you know, after they have thoroughly reviewed the plan that they would engage us, and and we certainly have things we want to communicate, uh, hopefully in person to them in terms of our execution plan. Um, I know there's particular interest in uh, our execution plan for city center, uh, how we're going to proceed with the guideway and stations. We're already underway with city center, I should mention, in terms of our utility relocations. That work, which we're, we've advanced ahead of the actual guideway and stations. And, of course, we've already acquired certain properties in city center. Any issues with EV? Because that was a big concern, which delayed this project in the first place, about the archaeological um, surveys. So far, no. Uh, we've done a lot of exploratory uh, drilling, if you will. We do these test holes. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of our design effort, uh, We've tried to avoid the areas where we believe there is EV. But if, if we do discover EV, we have a well-established plan at this point uh, in terms of how to deal with that properly. Okay. And uh, the whole deal with this review is that uh, we're banking on some federal money uh, in order to keep this project going. Right. So the original um, grant from the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, was $1.55 billion of which we've uh, already drawn about $800 million. So there's about 700, actually the number I, I know is $744 million of drawdown yet to be completed. And that's stopped at this point. So once the recovery plan is approved, we would expect the $744 million to start flowing again into the project. By when? By summer? We've, in our financial plan, which is included in the recovery plan, uh, we've estimated June 30th as the date that we would get at least the first $100 million. So we don't expect the entire amount all at once. It would happen over a course of time. But we are planning on the first $100 million uh, being drawn down starting at, at the end of June. So your meeting in April then is really to address any questions and concerns that FDA officials have about the plan and then hopefully speed things up so we get the federal funding That's place. correct. And we'd just like to highlight, uh, you know, what our execution plan is in terms of how we, you know, in, anticipate moving forward, first of all, awarding the contract for the city center and Pearl Highlands. We're in the procurement process right now. So going over that, that schedule, that plan, and then getting into the execution plan, which we expect would occur over the next um, 50 months or so. That would all lead up to the full completion of the project by the end of 2025. Okay, so will we see a lot more than activity? Is it your hope if all things go as planned uh, with the approvals like next year? 
Yes, uh, we expect the award of City Center and Pearl Highlands to be around February of next year. And uh, the other big news for next year is we actually intend to open the, the first 10 miles to passenger service um, by the fall of next year. So that'll, that'll be a big event in terms of actually having riders begin to use the system. Okay. All right. Now, you know, there were lots of um, eyes raised uh, when we uh, heard the news about uh, three federal subpoenas for rail documents. Uh, the city council uh, just this week, I think, has passed a rezo calling for a fren- forensic audit. Uh, let's take a listen. A forensic audit could result in criminal charges. And the hope that I really have is that once we get an honest account of what has happened, then we have a better place of knowing what to do now and how to best move forward. Even with the public-private partnerships, those contracts are now underway of being processed and awarded. And it seems that that also doesn't really have a clear path moving forward. So I feel that we do have to be very honest with ourselves and move toward a place of better accountability for our taxpayers. That was Honolulu City Council member uh, Heidi Suniyoshi. Um, she a uh, new, newcomer to the council, uh, but obviously just concerned about where we're at with, uh, with rail. So how are you looking at this forensic audit? Uh, well, you know, I think, uh, look, the project is be- significantly behind its original schedule and significantly over budget. So I think we have to be realistic that uh, people were going to ask the question, what happened and where did the money go? Why did we get into this situation? Having said that, uh, we've been the subject of about nine audits over the last 12 months. So many, many audits, uh, including the city audit and the state audit, which were released at the end of last year uh, into this year. And I think, you know, to a large extent, they they answered those questions. You know, there were significant delays on the project initially. You know, a lot of the focus on these audits is what happened from about 2016 backward into the beginning of the project. And there were significant issues in terms of delays to the project's lawsuits, moving from a slow economy into a strong economy and what effect that had on the bid prices that we received, but also in terms of the way that the project was being executed. So a lot of, a got, a lot of lessons learned, um, issues that were identified and you know, moving forward, uh, starting really in early 2017 with my immediate predecessor, Krishna Murthy, you know, he came in and, and initiated a lot of uh, more robust project controls, uh, the way we deal with change orders, and I've certainly picked up on a lot of those things that he, he initiated. And, and, and the result, I should say, is that for the last two years, we have not increased our budget by even $1. So, you know, these, these new controls that he put in and I picked up on have really uh, pro- proven themselves. And you still have his expertise on tap, right? Yes. I mean, I, I was smart enough to realize that, you know, at least uh, I could hold on to him on a part-time basis. He, uh, he's in a situation with his family where he didn't feel he could work full-time, but he, he is working part-time and advising uh, the project, and we're very happy to have him. Yeah. Now, I, I did talk with uh, Les Condo with the uh, Legislative Auditor's Office, and he says he's got two more reports um, yet to file uh, mm-hmm. regarding Hart. He said he had no problem as far as a cooperation with you or, or, or your staff, but he did, in, in his audits, pointed out that he had concern about the length of time that it took to receive documents. W- why was there that problem? Well, uh, I think for a couple of reasons, uh, the the volume of documentation that they wanted to look at was was very very large. So, uh, I think we struggled a little bit in terms of uh, meeting his timeline. But as we went on, we learned, and certainly uh, a lesson learned there. But uh, we managed to give him the documents that he needed. Um, he he pointed that out that he was able to reach the con- his conclusions, even though the the pace was a little bit slower than he wanted. And we also had to make access um, to, we have a documentation control system that's largely computerized, not entirely, but largely computerized. And I think people would relate to IT issues. We have a lot of IT issues. We have a legacy system that Oracle acquired and is no longer supported by Oracle. So, so we run into IT issues and when the auditors try to access our system, they also, 
experienced some some issues as well. So I think that contributed as well. Okay, um, Kondo made the point though that uh, he thought that it was unreasonable, you know, with these excessive delays, uh, including uh, his request to get minutes of the executive session meetings. He said he got about six months worth, but it was all redacted, so it was kind of pointless. Yes, uh, in, in terms of the board minutes, I mean, that's something that I don't even have access to. That's uh, that's in the custody of the board, and uh, they did redact certain minutes, and I know he made an issue out of that, but I, I think people need to understand that um, there are issues, there are privacy issues, for example, so if you have somebody's employment file, human resource file. You know, we have a, or the board has a um, responsibility to these employees to protect their privacy rights. So that, that, as I understand, was part of the issue in terms of why certain things were redacted. Right, and, and uh, he told us that it was on the advice of Corp Counsel. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you, it was the deputy or was it the, the um, top lawyer, you know, Don Leong, that was recommending that, that these things be withheld. I can't really comment on that because that was not really in my responsibility, but that was uh, legal advice that sounds like it was given to the board. But what, yeah. Was there a reason? Do you recall what the reason was? Why those things? Was it proprietary information or was it personnel issues? I, I'm sure that privacy issues in terms of human resource records was part of it, but beyond that, it's not information that I, I would have been privy to. So. One of the other things that the audit points out is uh, the lack of controls and reviews uh, on the consultant's performance because a large number of uh, staffers w had to be brought in from the outside because of their specialized expertise. Right. So the state auditor pointed that out, I think, in his second report in terms of uh, some of our current operations. When, whenever you execute a project like this, this is a mega project in terms of uh, – you know, construction right across the island. Um, it's it, it's a mega project, and when and it's specialized in this rail transit field. So we must have expertise, um, people with significant experience. And if you look at our roster of uh, of people that we have involved in this project, we have people with thirty, forty, even in excess of fifty years of experience. And so I need to have people like that on staff who have been there and done that. And of course, it's mixed in with uh, peop local people that are hired here from the islands because we have a lot of expertise in the islands too. We want to have that mix of uh, staff and of course we want to train uh, people who reside here to eventually you know, pick up and take over in terms of uh, project execution and, and then into the operations so and maintenance. What, so what but, are we doing then to um, uh, make sure that you know, that staff is doing what they're supposed to? Well, well, first of all, let me say out of a, we have about 130 city staff and I have about 18 of these specialized consultants that are embedded in our organization. So they all report essentially to me, you know, through a, a regular org chart like any company would have or any city department would have. So I, I don't really feel that the ratio is out of balance at all to have, you know, 18 experts out of about 150 people that are that make up the, the primary heart staff. We have other specialized consultants as well. Um, but, you know, over time, the a, even the 18 will reduce in number as uh, some of our city employees pick up their expertise. But there's always going to be a balance. Uh, uh, now, as, as things move forward, right now we're just building one project. But, you know, at some future date, if there are extensions to the project, and, and typically what you have when you're building a rail transit project is you start with a line, and then eventually over time there's a second line, a third line. And if, there, if we develop such a strategic plan here in Honolulu, I think you would see the mix of staff uh, moving more and more and more to uh, almost entirely uh, local people because then the experience is built up over time. Uh, is there anything specifically, though, that uh, you plan to change uh, as a result of this audit, you know, flagging that concern? Well, in terms of the way we measure the performance of our consultants, I think this is something that the auditor pointed out. And... And we agreed with him that um, we there are some changes that we will make in terms of the way we measure the performance, specifically of the company that 
that kind of sponsors these people. Uh, we're going to do a more robust measuring of their performance. And then uh, let's switch over to the uh, federal subpoenas. Uh, and I know there are three. <laughs> yeah. You've got any more letters in the mail? No. <laughs> and and I, I, when I first heard the news, I was like, oh, my goodness, it's like another request. And yeah. like you me- mentioned, that the files are voluminous. Uh, and I felt sorry for the staff, quite honestly, here, uh, you know, a large volume of material that you have to reproduce. Right. I suppose it could have been one subpoena uh, that requested all of the information, but the way it was delivered to us um, – it was in three parts, but it's, they're all similar in that they're requesting information, whether they're documents or correspondence or emails, and it was just presented in three different subpoenas. Uh, each one f- focuses on, in on a different aspect of the project. The first one was quite broad. I think there were nine or ten major areas that they asked for documentation from. The second one was a little, and third one were a little bit more specific. But, but you know, for, for us on staff, um, it becomes a task, like a project management task, like any other task. Okay, this is what we have to deliver. Let's organize ourselves. Let's plan the effort, organize how we're going to, um, you know, get all this information together and then how we're going to deliver it. So that's what we're doing is uh, executing a task to comply with the subpoenas. And have you met those deadlines or is there still an outstanding well, uh, there are so many documents involved that uh, we needed to uh, obtain an extension. Oh, so, you did request for an yes, extension. Yes, we did. So through di- uh, dialogue uh, with the uh, Department of Justice, they, they were understanding of that. And uh, we have started to turn over documents, though. So, for example, in the first one, which was very broad, uh, what the DOJ suggested is that we provide documents in a certain priority order as we pull them together. So following those instructions, we were able to get the first um, the first part of the requirement together, and we actually did submit, um, you know, a first set of documents to them. Are they going to be redacted? No, not those, no. And any of them, as far as you know, of, their, of those requests? I mean, if they were for the auditor. Well, the third subpoena dealt with the same board minutes that we discussed a few minutes ago. So I know the board is reviewing the uh, Department of Justice uh, requirement with the attorneys, and I I don't know what the outcome of that will be. Okay. And I know the state lawmakers had initially uh, planned to call for a forensic audit. I remember going to those hearings, and that was raised, and someone said, well, that's very narrow. You should just look more broadly, and that's what they went with initially. Well, I, I think the debate about the forensic audit has to do with, uh, you know, whether all of the subpoenas today, um, as well as the audits that have been performed, cover everything. So, for example, the city and the state audit pretty much look backwards in terms of Hart's performance prior to 2016, looked at you know, why were there cost overruns? What were the major reasons for that? Why is the schedule delayed? So, you know, there's one train of thought that says that the city audits already looked at all the performance issues. Uh, and now with the subpoenas, the Department of Justice presumably is looking for a wrongdoer. You know, perhaps there was somebody in the last 10 years that presumably uh, broke the law. And I think we all share the same feeling that if there is somebody like that, they should be identified and they should, you know, face the music in terms of, uh, in terms of justice. So, um, you know, there's one train of thought that says that that seems like that covers everything, but I know that others, you know, on the city council, for example, feel like there should be a separate forensic audit. And there are folks, uh, I think, that have filed a whistleblower lawsuits, you know, concerns over uh, how... Um, think the original contractor was operating and how certain contracts were let. Uh, there was some concern about uh, the property that was acquired. Uh, can you talk about some of those issues that were raised? Well, I think, you know, from my perspective, um, and the state auditor and the city auditor pointed out some of these issues as well in terms of the way, you know, primarily prior to 2016, uh, how we're uh, changes handled, change orders processed, um, you know, and, and there were deficiencies, you know, that seems pretty obvious, you know, from what I've seen. 
uh, in terms of the results. Um, there were deficiencies. And as I mentioned earlier, with my immediate predecessor, Mr. Murthy, I think he's, he made significant changes in, in the way that Hart uh, handles those kind of changes and, and processes change orders. And, you know, I've certainly picked up on that. And I believe we're doing much a much better job in terms of those issues. And, and, you know, the results are for the last two years, we've been on the budget. We haven't we haven't changed our budget for two years now. Okay. Well, if you're just joining the conversation, we're talking about rail, and we'd like to know what you think. You can uh, join the discussion by calling 941-3689 or 1-877-941-3689 from the neighbor islands. Our guest today, Andrew Robbins, the executive director of HART. And, uh, you know, we um, have uh, John Henry Felix. Uh, he is on the board of the Honolulu Authority for Rapid uh, Transportation. Uh, he is also um, uh we should add, a former board member and chair of Hawaii Public Radio. Last month, he wrote a column calling for rail to be stopped at Middle Street. He wrote, let us have a much-needed timeout now. We must stop at Middle Street, conduct an in-depth, in-depth, independent forensic audit, make systematic changes in rail's governance and management structure, revisit blatantly optimistic projections for ridership, capital, operational, and maintenance costs, get on the right track, and stop uh, hurtling toward a disastrous derailment. He let the board know what he thinks. Uh, your thoughts on, on stopping at Middle Street? Well, uh, you know, board member Felix, I know, is very thoughtful and uh, he has a lot of experience and I, I really uh, enjoy uh, um, my business dealings with him, if you will, uh, you know, in his role as a board member and my role as the executive director. Uh, but in terms of stopping at Middle Street and, and taking a pause, you know, to me, when I hear pause, that sounds like another word for delay. And you, you can look at the audits that were done, and the majority of the cost overrun are associated with delays, you know, for different reasons, of course. It had to do with uh, lawsuits that happened early in the project and other reasons, but a large amount of uh, money um, – uh, was attributed to delays in the project. So from my perspective, I don't really follow the logic of taking a pause. We, In fact, we're already working in city center. As I mentioned earlier, we've acquired, acquired properties and we're, we have a contract that we're executing right now to relocate the utilities to get them out of the way of the, the guideway and station construction that's coming later. So we are moving forward. We do have a plan. And we do have a budget to get to uh, Ala Moana. And I, I should also point out that the, the, the issue of the alignment, where does it go? So right now the project goes from East Kapolei to Ala Moana. That's called the minimum operable segment. And that was decided uh, as a public policy by the city council. And they went through all the public hearings to determine that policy and eventually voted on, on the, the MOS, as we call it. So Hart's mission really is to build that project. Um, you know, from my perspective, I don't make the policy that was already decided that it, it shall go from East Kapolei to Al Moana. Right, you've got your marching orders. Right. Now, if, if we didn't have enough money, that there would be an issue there. But the special session in 2017 um, deliberated on that and provided the additional funding that we need. Right, that's continuing the um, uh, half percent excise tax. Correct. And so uh, we've heard that, no, you can't divert from the original route because it would trigger a p- potentially a whole new EIS, delay the project, cost more. Some folks want to stop at Middle Street and, you know, rely on the buses or uh, I guess there, there are issues with blight and there, you know, a concern about uh, the cost. You know, we, we did, I think, go out. We had uh, a package for the rail uh, stations, and then I think you folks have now gone out separately for those. Uh, I think you're talking about the stations in right, the west, the stations. right? But in terms of moving forward to Ala Moana, um, you know, we talked about the project controls improvements that have been made uh, in recent years at Hart. The other thing that uh, we instituted was a robust risk management program. So what we have been doing now for over two years is really identifying 
all of the major risks of the project um, and putting probabilities to those risks and costs to those risks. And we track that as a management tool. And we report on that every month, and it's in the monthly report, which are posted on our website, so people can can look at what I'm talking about. But what the risk management program is telling us is that building to Ala Moana, uh, we have a very high probability of finishing the project on time and within our stated budget of $8.165 billion, which was the result of the special session in 2017. Yeah, we do have, uh, we had a caller on the line, Gary from the Big Island, uh, kind of shy, I guess, he hung up, but he <laughs> says the cost overruns are criminal. They should take the profit away from all the people mishandling the budget. Uh, it, yeah, people are just really worried about the price tag because it is such a big, fat price tag. Well, sure, I understand that. I mean, um, it's a mega project, and what we're trying to do is to build a, a major piece of infrastructure across the entire island and uh, and put a whole new transportation system in. Um, but, you know, this has a, been a plan, I know, in Oahu for 40, 50 years at least in terms of channeling the growth in this corridor between the mountains and the sea, keeping the country country, you know, all of those things that I know you, have, for one, have heard for many, many years and have been following. Um, so it's a major undertaking, and, and it does involve managing risk. And, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, I think we're, we're doing a much better job in terms of managing risk. Um, and as I mentioned, the, for the last two years, we've seen the results of that. Okay. Um, and uh, we've heard a lot about the development-oriented um, tra transit-oriented transit -oriented development, development, and we've right. also heard calls about it should be reversed. It should be, you know, uh, uh, development-oriented transit. Uh, I think it's debatable at this point because, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of already set the path. But uh, w what are the, the, the concerns a about that, you know, about all the growth that's supposed to come around these rail stations? Well, I think, you know, this is uh, another major topic because we're not only building uh, a new transportation system to improve mobility, but it's really building the city. And uh, between the city and the state, I've seen the transit-oriented development plans, you know, essentially around each station because there are city lands and there are state lands. And the plans are terrific in terms of increasing affordable housing, building workforce housing, uh, having lively communities and town centers. And uh, the challenge really now is really just implementing the plan. But um, between the city and the state, there really are terrific plans on, you know, how we intend to live, work, and play going into the future. I think it's very important to understand that we're also building for the future. So, for example, we have a station that, um, it, that's in the area called Ho'opili, which is basically farmland right now out in Eva. Uh, but uh, D.R. Horton is planning something like 10,000 homes. So in 10 years or so, it's no longer going to be a farm. It's gonna, there's going to be a community there. So there's no major highway improvements being planned to accommodate those 10,000 new residents. And then you know, below Mililani, I know there's another major development uh, going in there uh, with thousands of new homes. So, so this is where rail really comes in in terms of taking up the growth and providing uh, transportation and mobility uh, alternative for for folks as, as these communities are developed. And I, I know there is a concern for the folks on the Leeward Coast because they still have to drive in. And I know there's the issue of, okay, the park and rides, you know, mm -hmm. if they bring their car in, you know, from Waianae, go down to Kapolei, they've got a park. Uh, you know, you do have the uh, West Oahu campus there, and that's a whole other, uh, you know, big kind of bright spot, just another hub right. for traffic. Uh, but let's talk about, uh, for a second, the, the issues around uh, the stadium, right, the, the interchange, because you want to get folks from central Oahu down in there too, right? Right. Well, I think the, the major uh, transit station for central Oahu would be our Pearl Highland Station, and there's a major park and ride plan there with some 1,600 parking spaces. 
So that that probably will be the the primary uh, station or entry point to the rail system, where people in central Oahu can either take a bus or, I know I one of the new developments is talking about regular shuttles to and from the transit station. And are there issues um, developing around that? Well, it's a bit of a challenging terrain, um, it, in terms of the, the the way the land is there, but. Um, you know, we plan as part of our P3 uh, bundled together with the city center development. We will build the uh, the Pearl Highlands rail station as well as a transit center for for bus and the parking. So that that will happen prior to 2025 as well. And what about the interchange? Um, at Pearl Highlands, or or you mean at Aloha Al- Stadium? Aloha Stadium. Well. Next year, towards the end of next year, we plan to open the first 10 miles, which will take us from East Kapolei to Aloha Stadium. Um, So we're working very closely with the City Department of Transportation Services to make sure that when people, if let's say they get on at East Kapolei or or near Eva Beach, and they they go to either Pearl Ridge or Aloha Stadium, that they will the buses will be there, ready to take them the rest of the way into town. We did have another call on the line, Nikki from Honolulu, uh, but she, uh, she 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 didn't want to stick around, but she says from the time that the rail surfaced, uh, she's wondering if we have absolute numbers for the usage of the train. When the rail project came up, she said she didn't think it was feasible. Who hired the first person that was in charge of the rail? <laughs> <laughs> so talk about numbers, ridership. Okay. Well, the, the current the current project that we're building uh, really got started in the mid two thousands um, when uh, Mayor Hanneman was mayor. Th- his administration really kicked off the the development of the rail project that uh, that we're actually building today, and. Uh, you know, firms were hired in terms of doing the initial planning and the initial projections uh, for the ridership. So the number right now that we're projecting once the system is fully up and running um, at the end of 2025 is about 120,000 riders on an r- average weekday. Yeah. And and where are we at? Because I know that the city is uh, rolling out that smart card where you can actually take the bus and take rail, you know, right. kind of one card for everything. Right, and it's called the Holo card, and it's a smart card for bus and rail at this point, although there's a lot of talk about including the Beaky bike system into that at some point. So it's really intended to be a multimodal transportation smart card that you can use between different modes of transportation. So we have something working again together with the city. We've rolled it out on the bus first, and there's some 3,000 initial users that are out there today using the Holo card. The, the readers for the card are on every bus today, and the system is fully functional. And the, there are experts that are making sure that that system is working. There's a whole back office counting system because it's an account-based system. When you, you have the physical card, but you have an account that you can access online in terms of tracking your spending and adding money to the card and so forth. So we have like 3,000 beta users, you know, uh, as it's called, and that's fully functioning. And I know the bus plans to go essentially into full operation with the whole card um, uh, almost by June or, or July of this year. And then it'll be rolled out on the on the train as well. Well, this is The Conversation on Hawaii Public Radio. You can join the discussion by calling 1-877-941-3689. Stay with us. We'll be right back after a break. Support for Hawaii Public Radio comes from Bishop Museum, presenting the exhibition Rapa Nui, The Untold Stories of Easter Island, on view now through May 5th. More information at bishopmuseum.org. In the morning, I have my juice, my toast, and the BBC. In the evenings, especially Saturdays and Sundays, I I like Seth Marcos' show, um, I love American Roots. If I'm in the mood for classical music, again, I can just push the other button and listen to it. If I'm driving, it seems like whatever's on is good. Member supported, Hawaii Public Radio. Radio with vision. Listen and see. Support for Hawaii Public Radio comes from Haleakala Ranch with a legacy of livestock, conservation, and land stewardship since 1888, working to create, maintain, and preserve open spaces for the Maui community. More at haleakalaranch.com.
If you're just joining us, our in-studio guest is Heart Executive Director Andrew Robbins. Uh, we do have a couple of calls on the line. A gig from Honolulu. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, actually several. Um, Andrew used to work with Bombardier, who had put in the proposal to uh, put in a monorail instead of a steel wheel on steel rail um, system. Um, if you look at the numbers, the steel rail system right now will move at the maximum 5,000 people an hour. Um, if you look at the times that people go to work, seven, eight, nine, that only means 15,000 people an hour, I mean a day, would be able to go to work and come home basically in that three hour period. If you look at those numbers and you put in the number of people that are planned for Ho'opili, there will be no room for anybody except the people at Ho'opili. Uh, and the people who really need it live farther out in Waianae and Nanakuli, and there won't be any room for anybody except those people at Ho'opili. Um, number two, um, as uh, Andrew will uh, tell you, that Bombardier's original proposal was under $4 billion that included Waikiki and the university and the airport. And and, and Saldo, and, and, and uh, um, an insolvent for a long-time company whose contracts were canceled in most of Europe because of their poor products is the person who's building this and has gone from the original bid to now almost $10 billion, or three times over the original budget. Um, also, one other fact that I'm, Andrew wasn't there for, but uh, should be explained, is at one point they said that the engineering that had been done was uh, $100 million wasted on the engineering. Yet, in 1992, an engineer, one engineer and one architect worked out all five routes uh, in the two-month period. And the question is, did they spend a uh, million dollars apiece on 100 engineers? Or was that $100,000 on 1,000 engineers? Um, the waste on this project is incredible. And the fact that we don't have a monorail and a modern system that would move people, and also um, uh, you realize that the monorails can also move many more people. The one in uh, Tokyo it was almost 400,000 people a day, and yet ours is going to be limiting to just a few thousand. Thank you, Gil, for that. Um, Andrew, do you want to address uh, some of those issues that he's raised? Okay, I'll, I'll do my <laughs> best. Um, well, you're right uh, in terms of uh, former work with Bombardier. Uh, you're mostly referring to the, the former rail plan back in the early 1990s when uh, Bombardier, that, that was actually a, an open bid, if you will, where you could propose any technology that met the performance requirements. So at that time, uh, Bombardier did bid a monorail project and I, other bidders had other technologies, in, and w including steel wheel and steel rail, which eventually was the technology that was even chosen at that time. The current project um, was handled a little bit differently where under the city leadership, they they uh, assembled a list of a, a, a group of experts who then came to the conclusion that uh, automated light rail transit should be the technology, and that's what we're building today. And the project back in the early 90s was uh, about 14 miles, as I recall, that did go to the university, but started at Pearl City, so a little bit different. And of course, you know, you're talking about close to 30 years ago, so. It's hard to compare the dollars uh, between then and now without talking about escalation over that time. Um, the caller also mentioned about the capacity of the system. Uh, the initial system that we're building with 24 car trains has a capacity of, of over 7,500 passengers per hour per direction. And then that is expandable in the future by adding more cars or more trains to the system to over 15,000 passengers per hour per direction. So uh, in this way, we're able to handle the daily ridership that's expected. So you really start by doing a projection of ridership and then designing your system according to that. And that's what, what has been done here. And where are we at with the cars, within all those cars? Well, at the mo we're expecting to, uh, the contract calls for 24 car trains. So that's a total of 80 individual cars, if you will. 
And we have six trains on island right now. And we expect to have the full fleet of 20 trains um, no later than the middle of next year. Okay, so they'll be arriving as they are. They're coming almost one a month at this point. And all the engineering issues that uh, arose early on, those have been dealt with? Well, we're always dealing with issues. Um, So we have a list of issues that we're dealing with. We'll only accept trains when they are exactly according to our specifications. So until that time, we we either don't accept the trains or we we require Ansaldo to have a remedial plan to get us to the point where all the trains are meeting the specifications. Have we rejected any shipments? We've held up some shipments in, in the past uh, until everything was resolved. We have inspectors that actually go into the factory before the trains are ever ever shipped to make sure that they're ready for shipment. And where are we at with uh, all the those uh, shims, <laughs> you know, all, all, all those plates, I guess, that uh, initially were having some problems? Right. So, you know, prior to the time I came on board, a decision was made to attach the, the track work directly to the concrete deck, if you will, um, where other systems have uh, what's called a second pour of concrete, like two ribbons of concrete. Uh, the decision was made to reduce uh, the cost by eliminating the two ribbons and then using shims under the, the track work. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the shims had material issues and they were defective. But the contractor, Kiwit, came through, replaced the, all of the shims so that that issue is completely resolved now. So we're good. Yes. Well, you know, earlier in the program, we mentioned a column that was written by hard board member John Henry Felix. He's also a former board member and board chair of Hawaii Public Radio. And in that column, uh, Mr. Felix called for rail to stop at Middle Street. Uh, We talked with him this morning. He says he's also sending a letter tomorrow to the entire hard board uh, and to you, Mr. Robbins. And in this letter, he urges the hard board to go on record welcoming the forensic audit as called for by the Honolulu City Council. He writes that it is inconceivable that the Honolulu Rail Project would be over budget by $4 billion without the high likelihood that some strategic misrepresentation of costs has occurred. He also says that a forensic audit will work wonders in getting this project back on track, and he closes by writing, there is no substitute for transparency. Reaction to that? Well, he's addressing his fellow board members, um, but I can tell you on behalf of the the professional staff, uh, you know, at this point, the city council has voted in favor of carrying out a forensic audit, so we only have one reaction to that, which is to fully comply. And, uh, you know, when the time comes after they budget for that and they hire a firm to to carry out the forensic audit, we will certainly welcome the auditors into our office, um, be fully cooperative with them, and uh, comply with the wishes of the city council. Without the redacted documents? Uh, I mean, because if you redacted it for the state auditor, uh, now you've got the feds and now you've got uh, the city uh, council calling for the forensic audit. Are you going to redact all of those? Well, again, uh, the the only documents that I understand were redacted had to do with the board executive session minutes, which are not in my custody. Staff has no access to them. Everything that's accessible to staff, all of the project records, change orders, contracts, all of that information would be unredacted and we would fully make those documents available uh, to the auditors. Um, you know, from, from the Hart staff's viewpoint, it, it's a public project, it, it's open, we have nothing to hide in that regard. Okay. I think there's just some concern with trust issues that our community is having with, you know, the public corruption uh, scandal that's uh, hitting the city now. Uh, just concern that, you know, you put trust in government officials, elected officials, some of them, to do the right thing, and, and then you find out later, you know, something's amiss and there's a, yes. a federal investigation. So, uh, you know, this project is costing a lot of money, and we want to know that our money is being spent properly and uh, isn't going to line somebody's pocket somewhere. No, I I fully understand, and, and, you know, the difficulty that the project uh, got itself into in the past caused a a loss of public trust, and I totally understand that. And I also understand it's hard to regain trust once it's uh, lost. 
you know, the best thing I think I can do and the staff can do is to just meet our commitments from this point forward. So do our job, meet our commitments, uh, hit our marks, and be as transparent as we possibly can, and I'm dedicated to that. And I'm hoping that over time, if we do what we say from this point forward, which I fully intend to do, we get the system to the point where we can open the first 10 miles towards the end of 10 years, that little by little, you know, I'm hoping that the public will regain some trust in, in, in the project and what we're doing. And how's the morale doing with staff? Because I'm sure it must be hard for them to. Well, you know, most of the staff came uh, to build a project and, and, you know, they really have bought into the benefits of the project. They believe in the project. You know, no one came necessarily to prov provide thousands of documents for one auditor after another. But, but you know, uh, I think in general staff understands they have a job to do. Um, and even though it may be tough sometimes and, you know, there's a lot of pressure on folks uh, and they read a negative things in the newspaper quite often, you know, as I walk around, people are still pretty upbeat about what they're doing and they, they can understand that we have a, a focus to get this project up and running and deliver on the benefits that we've been talking about. Um, a listener submitted uh, this comment to Facebook. Uh, a summoner says, you know, listening to this conversation, uh, he believes speaking about uh, development in rail, why are we adapting to these developers just building to make money off, uh, he says, mainland people coming and buy, buying these homes that local people cannot afford. They should be mandated to build affordable housing first. They should have to give money for rail. Uh, this island cannot stand any more people coming to live here. Wake up frustration there well you know what I what I can tell everyone is that I I have the privilege of working with colleagues from the city and the state on a regular basis and I've I get to see the plans uh, for transit oriented development and I've I've seen similar plans in other parts of the country and I think we have great plans here and I, there is a real um, belief on the part of public public workers public officials that they want to improve the quality of life here and uh, you know they are dedicated to creating more uh, affordable housing workforce housing livable communities walkable communities um, you know the ability to, to maybe you don't need two or three cars anymore in a family maybe you can get by with one car if you had a, a viable option uh, you know with bus and rail and Beaky, for example so there's a lot of dedicated people working within the city, within the state, as well as in the private sector, who really understand uh, what the caller was talking about and are dedicated to doing something about it. And we really see a, a multimodal transportation system as kind of the impetus to, to accomplish those goals. Where are we at with um, artwork for the rail stations? Well, thank you for asking <laughs> that, because uh, it's one of, I call, the, the secrets of the rail project is that until we open the system, people won't get to see it. But I've had a sneak preview of, oh. you know, the, some of the artwork. And it, it is fantastic. I mean, um, we have local artists that have been commissioned to include art in every station. Um, and it, it intends to tell the story of the area. So, for example, we're, we have Hawaiian station names now for each of our stations. And... We've had uh, Hawaiian groups assembled uh, with the idea, of let's tell the story of where the station is. Right, in the provide the input. Right, so yeah. it starts with the name of the station, but then as you walk into the station, you're going to see artwork that has to do with the location. You're going to see placards that tell the story of that area. And I think, you know, this is going to be one of the benefits when we look back 20, 30, 50 years from now that we put that into the system, I think, is, is going to be really appreciated. And I know uh, there was lots of hand-wringing over the H3 when that was built, and that was the most expensive municipal project. You know, now this will be. But uh, w given the problems that we've seen with the poly, I think a lot of folks are saying, thank goodness we have an alternate route. Right. And, uh, you know, even I thought, okay, the poly's closed, but there's two other major routes to get to and from windward side. But I think people have seen you just take one of those away, it affects transportation everywhere, not just to the windward side. So we're talking with the rail system about taking 40,000 car trips off the road every day. You know, in the, in the scheme of things, that may not seem a lot, but that's about equivalent, as I understand, to what the poly 
moves on a daily basis. So if we take 40,000 car trips away from the road system, it will have a uh, positive effect on the entire system. Right. So people keep that view, uh, you know, re regardless of what else swirls, what scandals are squirreling, that that's the, that's the objective. Exactly. And again, you know, we have, uh, we have people that will comply with uh, the document uh, requirements of the subpoenas and the auditors. Uh, but on the other hand, we continue to move forward with the project. We're going to continue to build this project. We're focused on opening the first 10 miles next year and opening the full system by 2025. Okay, you've got about 30 seconds. Any other last final thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand uh, th this project's been going on a long time. There's been bad news associated with the project. There's construction impacts, which nobody enjoys. But, you know, it, it's time to start demonstrating the actual benefits of the system. That's why we're focused on opening the first 10 miles next year. And when I say next year, you know, people look, have a surprised look on their face. But we're really focused on that. And I think once people start to experience and get to use it, they'll see, you know, what this is all about. Okay. I recall when you folks were testing the lines, they ran, they ran by a, an elementary school on the other side, and they said the kids were cheering when they saw the train move for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Future it's, riders. It's starting to be real. Okay. Well, Thank you, Andrew Robbins, Hart Executive Director. And we'd like to thank you, the listener, for joining us on today's show. If your call didn't make it on the line, uh, contact the Talkback line and leave your comments. 808-792-8217. You can also email us at talkback at hawaiipublicradio.org. I'm Catherine Cruz. Join us tomorrow for more of The Conversation. <laughs>